This is a CGC unboxing, but it's not what you think. Hey there, today I have a CGC unboxing. However, this is not from CGC, so let me explain. Uh, I participated in an auction from a place that I had not purchased from before, and that place is Hakes Auctions. I think it's Hakes, not uh, Hacks or something like that, but it is an auction site that is run a little bit like Heritage Auctions in a couple of ways, and then different in some other ways. So let me explain a little bit if you're not familiar with Hakes Auctions. Essentially, it's an auction it's a website where comic books and other collectibles are auctioned off. And similar to Heritage and other auction sites, instead of it just being like eBay where it's just a random book that kind of goes up at any time, it is a specific collection of items and it's all cataloged under one auction and that auction starts and ends around the same time. The other similarity to Heritage that I know a lot of people don't like is there is a buyer's premium attached to the auction. So sometimes the amount as far as what you're paying or, or what your bid amount is, you have to do the math in your head or have a spreadsheet or calculator handy to make sure that you're not overbidding or overpaying for books. But what I liked about Hake's auction uh, is number one, I thought the selection was very good. Uh, I feel like sometimes only the holiest of grails and the highest possible grades are sort of reserved for heritage in a way. They're able to acquire those books and uh, those are the ones that you often find there. So if you're looking for a, a high grade key or grail, that's really not the only place you can go. But if you're looking to buy it online and, and bid on a, an item like that, then heritage is your uh, source for those sorts of books. With Hakes, it, it maybe was like a, a step down. It's not that they didn't have grails or keys there. They certainly did. But I was able to find other books that are more in my area of interest, where we're talking about non-keys or just high-grade older books, uh, moderns that maybe are overlooked or haven't been uh, thought of in a while, uh, and not so much your Amazing Fantasy 15s and Hulk 181s. I certainly want to get to the unboxing, but I think it's important to kind of know just how the process works before I show you the books. I know all the books that I got. There's there's not going to be like a grade reveal, but I wanted to show you each book one at a time, uh, obviously show you the grade, and then show you what I paid for the book and kind of compare it to the fair market value at the time that I won the auction, which this particular auction was from September 2022. So very quick to ship the books out. Uh, I'm very curious to see how it's packaged. It looks exactly like a CGC shipment, so I imagine the packing inside is more or less the same. So we'll find out here in a second. But the last piece that I I think I enjoyed, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed it at the time because I really thought it was true, is I think that I got some deals. Uh, as a comic book collector, that's what I'm into, comic books, but also I'm into trying to find the best deals possible and make intelligent decisions with my money. And a lot of times when you're looking for books, you have to kind of let the deal come to you. If you're on the hunt for a particular book, then you may end up overpaying for it because you just have it in your mind and in your heart that you want that comic book and you're going to pay for it no matter what, and you're gonna get caught up in a bidding frenzy. And what I did with Hake's auctions is shocking. I built a spreadsheet that helped me prepare. Uh, the last little bit of information about Hake's auctions is that all of the items start and finish at the same time. So if you go and you bid, and, and there's hundreds of items, and if you're targeting a book, you may miss out on 50 other books all closing at the same time. So how do you know which books to bid on? How do you know which ones are good deals and which ones aren't? Uh, you know, you'd be targeting certain books. You'd be looking at a Wolverine number one, uh, the limited series, and you're like, I have to have that one book. Meanwhile, uh, there's another Wolverine number one or other books related to Wolverine or Deadpool or whoever you're chasing right now and you end up missing out. Uh, the The only little thing is if there is a bid that comes in, I think in, in the last 20 minutes, then there's like a time extension. So I don't know how they do it exactly. It's They run it like a soccer or a football game. It's just like the referee says add more time. But 
if you're down to the wire and you bid, then the clock gets pushed back a little bit and you have a few extra minutes uh, or other bidders have a few extra minutes. So that's the nerve wracking part for me. I, I'll put in a bid, I know I'm the high bidder, and it's the countdown and you're down to like 30 seconds, somebody else comes along and bids and it's pushed out another five minutes and then you have to wait and do it all again. Uh, same thing if you're bidding, if, if you're waiting to uh, maybe cut somebody or snipe, then you have to wait until the timer runs out. So part of it's exciting, part of it's nerve wracking, that's the thrill of the auction, but I think it's time to get this unboxed and go through the books and look at the prices. Uh, maybe some of the books, uh, the book values have changed since uh, I won the books, but we'll take a look at where the values sit now and just kind of what hopefully percentage gain or value gain I added by acquiring these books. So let me get this open. I wanna see how Hake's Auction packaged these CGC slabbed comic books. All right, so very similar to, I would say, the way that CGC packs and they probably save packing material. I don't know exactly. So again, very similar to Heritage, a lot of the same sort of paraphernalia that comes with it, uh, other advertisements for future auctions, examine all the contents and so forth. And it looks like what they did is they put the slabs inside UPS Express envelopes to add it, some additional padding. And I'm sure those are free, save, uh, save on some packing materials. Uh, yes, all these are slabs in here. Uh, they do have raw books, and similar to Heritage, uh, you can get like raw book lots. And I just stayed away from that. It was much easier for me. I'll do that with Heritage because we're dealing with very specific, like Silver Age keys and things like that. And I'll, I'll be I'll target raw books or, or packs of raw books. Uh, but in this case, with this was the very first time I participated in an auction from Hakes Auctions, and I wanted to just go ahead and focus on slabs because it was easier for me to figure out which books were deals. All right, so we do have some tape around these. At least it's painter's tape. Hopefully it's easier to get into. I don't have to worry too much about bending raw books. Normally the tape monster surrounds. And in no particular order, I just grabbed these randomly. Uh, this is Strange Academy number one, and this is the Walmart edition. I'm not a Walmart pack hunter, uh, but uh, I, I did, sorry, I got distracted on the back. Um, they put a Hakes auction sticker right up there. Uh, not a fan of that. I hope I can peel that off without it damaging the slab. So. Um, that's really, really dumb. <clears throat> I don't want that on my slab, on my collectible. I don't want an advertisement. Um, I'll deal with that later. Uh, back to the book. I'm not a big Walmart fan, uh, Walmart pack hunter or anything like that, but I'm, I'm all about Strange Academy. And I really like this Humberto Ramos cover. And it's got all of the first appearances of the Strange Academy characters. So... There's the first book, um, and that's a 9.8 white pages. I guess I should call that out uh, specifically. They're not all 9.8s. Uh, and it was books that ranged from modern new releases that came out in 2020 to a book like this. This is Strange Tales number 159, and this is from 1967, and it's a CGC 4.5 off-white to white pages. Uh, love this uh, Starenko cover. I appreciate uh, Starenko's art and his covers, his legacy in comic book history and lore, uh, but I don't own a lot of his books with covers, and so really, really happy to get this one. I uh, just list Captain America appearance, origin of Nick Fury, and the first appearance of Val. Strange Tales 159. And so that was, th those two are a great example of some of the books that were in this auction. And it was just a matter of me going through my analysis and saying, okay, here's the book, here's the grade, what is the GPA value, and seeing what it went for. And then being able to kind of open up those items all at once and make sure that I had bids out appropriately. Uh, here's another one, uh, a great book. This was uh, spec'd on right around the time that Eternals came out in the MCU. And this is Strange Tales number 179. This is a 7.0. What I love about this, other than the collectability 
and maybe the spec on Pip the Troll is that it's white pages. So very, very cool to get uh, a book like this in white pages. Pre presents very well, can I say that, uh, right? Uh, since it's not a like a 9.4 or above. Um, but a great looking book, love the white pages. The corners are really poorly dinged, but uh, great colors on this one. Can't wait to display it. Uh, Jim Starlin, story, cover, and art. So a couple of great Strange Tales back issues there. Um, and I love it. I think I got a great deal on this 7.0. Okay, now on to the second pack. It's a little tough with the painter's tape. I, I will say that uh, at least the first three slabs, they came in uh, great shape. I don't see any dings or scratches or any indication that anything was damaged in transit. So really, really well packed order. Uh, the only thing with the painter's tape and everything, you're kind of ruining the bags that the slabs come in. Uh, you just end up pulling the tape off the bag or you're trying to cut through it. So I'm gonna have to figure out how to get, I don't have like hundreds of extra slab bags. Um, so I'll have to figure out how to get replacements for those. Uh, plus they put a sticker right on it. I don't, again, I, you know, to each their own, but like if I'm running a business and I understand, you know, people have slabs, yes, but they usually have a bag um, and just like a comic book bag, if you put stickers and labels all over it, then it has to be replaced. Again, really disappointed with the sticker on the back. Uh, so I'll be going through and fixing all of that later. But back to the books. Here is Defenders 84. Uh, this is an 8.5 white pages. Again, I love targeting uh, books in a lesser grade, but having the white pages. This lists only uh, on the label as a Black Panther appearance. Uh, again, I was not like seeking this book out in particular. Uh, this may only be like the second or third issue of Defenders I've ever owned, but it was one of those where I, the deal, the opportunity kind of presented itself based on my formulas, and I decided to put in a bid, and I think that was one of the first ones that I won, because a lot of the other books that I bid on, the timer kicked in and there was an extension on the auctions, so I had to wait around, but I remember I think that was the very first one. Uh, that one, I think, and along with this one as well. This is Captain Marvel number 27. And this is an 8.5 off-white to white pages from 1973. On the label, you've got Thanos, Star Fox, Mentor, Death, Super Scroll, and Avengers appearance with a Drax cameo. So just thinking about Guardians of the Galaxy, Star Fox slash Arrows, a great book from 1973. And to get it in 8.5, uh, I'll take that. Now, it's, and it's extremely dark cover on the top half so you know likely to incur lots of damage so to have it an 8.5 i'm happy with that don't like the miswrapping not a fan it's not what i would maybe pick out uh, now all of this had photos so i i certainly could have backed out on it if i didn't want um to have a, a miswrapped book like this but in any case uh even an 8.5 of this book uh i feel again that for the grade and for the the value i think it was a good pickup now, with most of the things that I buy, there's usually one book or something where I, I'm like, I, I get sort of triggered over it and I, I end up acquiring it and then I feel like I have to sort of, sort of buy around it because I can't just get one. And this was one of the first books that I saw that I thought had really good value. It's from 1980. Uh, there's a little bit of scuffing on this one. As I said, the no damage on the cases, but I don't know if that can be buffed out or not. This is Avengers 195. And this is a 9.8 white pages. Uh, this was a book that I targeted early. I felt like probably not really on a lot of people's radar at this point. It is the first appearance of Taskmaster in cameo on last page. <laughs> very, very specific. So you don't have the, uh, you know, just first cameo appearance or first appearance. Um, I understand the word cameo and what that means, but a first appearance is a first appearance. It's just not the first full or the first in story. Uh, lots of different ways, but uh, most people love Avengers 196 because Taskmaster's on the cover and it's first full. Uh, but I like this one as well. And it's kind of like a Hulk 180, 181. Obviously, I'm not saying Taskmaster's at, at Wolverine's level or anything, but uh, similar that this is a first appearance 
and I just couldn't pass up the fact that it was uh, a 9.8 white pages. Now, to me, looking at it, it does look a little muted, almost like there's some fading or something going on with the book where it just doesn't look as bright and, and vibrant as you normally would expect. Uh, frankly, the back cover looks better, so it's almost like maybe this sat in a store window, which I've had books get kicked back. I'm staring at one on the wall on the other side here behind the camera where um, it's a 9.4, and the Grader's Notes talked about like fading or tanning on, on the front cover as if it got too much like sunlight or exposure. This looks like really, really faded. Maybe that's why it went for less than it should have. I don't know, but it is slabbed in a 9.8. And I'm looking at the condition. It looks super sharp. Uh, razor sharp corners, edges look really, really nice. Just, just the colors don't, they're just not as bright as I would typically expect. But I love the book. Um, I have one copy of this raw. Um, now I don't have to worry about it because I've got it here in a 9.8. And Taskmaster, I think, is coming when, whenever Thunderbolts comes out uh, next year, five years from now. Uh, and the Taskmaster from the Black Widow movie in the MCU is supposed to be in it, so there will probably be another little bit of a, a bump, I would say, on Taskmaster books, but it's not the Taskmaster from the comics, so we'll have to see how that plays out over time if collectors are really still interested in, like, books where the character has appeared, but it's maybe some alteration to the character in some way, uh, even just like, sometimes... A costume or character design kind of throws me off it's just it's not the same but I understand you can only do so much to make a character look reasonable and believable in the in a, in a in a movie but we'll have to see over time if people will I guess accept that a character like Taskmaster has been altered a little bit um, in the MCU so we'll see all right back to the books the next one, another 9.8 white pages. This is New Mutants number 13, the first appearance of Cypher. Uh, Cypher played a role in Hoxpox, and I love New Mutants, Claremont here. And these New Mutants books, to me, they're always sort of tough. The colors are great, but the sort of the pink and the red on the side, they, they typically always have color breaks. Um, so this looks to be in great, great condition. Love this one. Chris Claremont's story, Sal Buscema and Tom Mandrake art, and a Brett Blevins cover. Also, Big Kitty Pride fan, so the fact she's on the cover uh, definitely made this book very appealing to me. And I, again, I'm saying it on most of the books. I guess we'll let the numbers judge for themselves. But again, looking for great deals. I wasn't seeking this book out, but I was aware of it. It was a book that I was buying raw because of the uh, first appearance of Cypher. Uh, so now I've got it graded in a 9.8. Okay, next one, another 9.8. This is Power Girl number two. And the significance with this one is the cover. Uh, hopefully it goes without saying, but it is an Adam Hughes cover. Uh, there's some notation about two covers existing, one by Amanda Connor and one by Adam Hughes. Uh, I don't know why that's specifically called out on the label, but this, I would say, is not... Hughes is like one of his more famous covers, like a lot of his Catwoman covers, I think, really stand out. Some of his Tomb Raider, uh, certainly countless others. But this one, I think, is maybe in that second group of Hughes covers that are sought after. Uh, this was just listed, and there wasn't much of a bidding frenzy. And a lot of times what I did, I had my spreadsheets and all of my data that was like guiding me towards certain books. And then I would just cross-check them with eBay's last sold or, or books that were listed on eBay uh, that maybe were up for auction or whatever, just as kind of a, a way for me to triple check, like, is this really a good deal? Because sometimes it looked too good to be true. But I think that it's the, the auction site itself, it almost put it at a little bit of a disadvantage. The auctions ran during the week. You know, so I think it's difficult for people to really set aside several hours on like a Tuesday or a Wednesday to participate in an auction. I know there's a lot of like claim sales and everything that go on, but I think it was just kind of not not as much activity or attention on it uh, and just the timing of everything, plus everything ending at the same time. Uh, books like Power Girl number two, it was just there and I couldn't help but bid on it. All right, so this book, um, there's really... I. I I feel like I got 
got it at a, at a pretty decent deal. But this is Spider-Geddon number one. Uh, if you've watched my other videos and you see the books behind me, uh, I'm trying to casually collect Spider-Man number one homage covers. Uh, not all of them, just ones that I like. And this is a great Philip Tan homage cover to McFarlane's Spider-Man number one. I had just decided I was going to treat myself to this one and display it up uh, on the wall next to my other Spider-Man number ones uh, and my other homage covers. Uh, there's no spec value here. There's no uh, real collectability or desirability that I can determine other than the fact that it is that homage cover. So I believe it's a KRS Comics exclusive. So this will look great next to my other Spider-Man one. Okay, last pack. Got a four pack of books in this one. And this one is, the first book in this pack is New Avengers number seven. This is the uh, Neil Adams variant cover featuring the Sentry. And this is the first appearance of the Illuminati. Uh, I much prefer cover A. But I remember um, I bought this book raw from Midtown. Like when I first got back into the hobby back around 2019, uh, it looked like a 9-8 candidate. Uh, it may have been in the first batch I sent to CGC, got it, hit it in a 9-8, and then sold it for some outrageous amount. I want to say it was like somewhere between $280, $320 because the Illuminati were rumored. I don't know. I had a little bit of seller's remorse, even though I, I made a nice profit on it and always wanted to replace it. I do have cover A in a 9.8 white pages, so now I have this book to go with it again. We'll kind of see what happens with the Illuminati going forward. I hope it wasn't a one and done. I do like the concept of, you know, the mysterious kind of A-list characters behind the scenes that are, are maybe making decisions that they shouldn't be making and things like that. I like the concept of that, so I hope they bring it back. Again, not my favorite cover, but... I like the significance that it's the first appearance of the Illuminati. They're not on the cover of uh, cover A anyway, so I like this as kind of a, a pair with cover A. And the best part, I didn't pay anywhere close to what I sold my copy for originally. Okay, next one is uh, Marvel 2-in-1 number 54, and this is a 9.0 white pages. Uh, these Marvel 2-in-1 books or... or Marvel team-ups. These were not books that I really collected or owned. Uh, I, I kind of thought that they were... What If is another one where I, I just felt like it really wasn't in continuity. I know these are in continuity or they're, they're, they're Marvel canon or whatever you want to call it, but I just felt like they were side stories and they didn't really fit in with the main storylines of these characters. I've since come around to that and I appreciate the age of the book. This is from 1979. Uh, we've got Deathlock, Quasar, and Thundra making an appearance. Uh, first appearance of the Grapplers, Letha, Titania, Poundcakes, and Screaming Mimi. So who knows? Uh, Titania's in the MCU. Uh, who knows if the Grapplers show up and then this book uh, spikes. Uh, you never know. But uh, not really buying it for speculation on uh, a team of heroines or villains led by Titania. But I love it for the age. 9.0 white pages. Uh, great Deathlock cover with the cover art provided by George Perez. So, great book. All right, last two. Let's see which one I want to do first here. How about Marvel Premiere number 10 featuring Doctor Strange, 7.5. Again, white pages. Love that. And this is the first appearance of Shuma Gorath. So, these were books that right before Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness... Uh, these sorts of books were being specced on. I think even before that, we were talking about WandaVision and possibly other creatures and characters getting into that story. And there was always speculation uh, around, obviously, Mephisto, but some of the other mystic art-related characters, monsters, and things. Uh, and terribly miswrapped on this one. Um, so that one is what it is. It, not my favorite type of book to collect. Um but a lot going on in this book that I think makes it very collectible. The 7.5, you know, you're getting into that mid-grade type of area. But the fact that it's 7.5 white pages, um, really great, like, nostalgic-looking book. And now that 
you know, all of the speculation around these characters and things, it's cooled off because the movies have come and gone. I love picking it up now because it, it almost feels like leftovers, like nobody wants these anymore. I, it's, I love grabbing it. I think even more so after the movie, uh, now there's there's this period of where I think people are either let down or burned out with the spec. All the hype is just dialed down to zero. Plus with the market values also being down, uh, it's just, it's a great time to pick up books like this. Very, very affordable grade. And now love the fact that I have a copy. And the last book is another Strange Tales book. This is Strange Tales 181 9.0 White Pages. So a lot of these books were white pages. There's a clown on the cover, so you can't go wrong with that. But we know that Warlock's coming. He's been cast. He's going to be at least in Guardians 3. Could show up in the Guardians ho uh, Holiday Special. We don't know, but this is a really, really fun Jim Starlin cover. Cover credits go to Starlin and Alan Weiss. Uh, it just notes that the story is continued in Warlock number nine. Just a great, fun book from 1975. In fact, this has was graded as White Pages. Love that. 9.0. So very, very happy with these. Uh, as far as the, the shipment went and the packing, all of that I think was top notch. A little annoyed, as always, with the tape and cutting through, cutting bags, things like that. I think that there's a better way to do it. I mean, the fact that um, they use these UPS bags... If they're not moving around in here, you can pretty much wrap it pretty tight and then maybe wrap tape around this. Get rid of the stickers on the back, get rid of the stickers on the bags, do something else with it, put an insert in the bag, just a piece of paper, uh, post a note, uh, anything. Uh, but for the most part, the most important thing is the books and the fact that they're graded. Everything came through as ordered, as I paid for. The shipping was a little outrageous. Uh, it was very, very expensive. I feel like they just had UPS weigh this thing and it was a very, very heavy and large container and they paid just regular ground shipping on this and I had to pay for it. Uh, so that is something that as I go through the values and apply like I typically do, the shipping and the tax and the buyer's premium, Maybe I didn't get quite a deal that I thought of, but I still think I did pretty well. So I think overall, I'm pretty happy with the experience. I think if I apply some of the tax or shipping or buyer's premium fees, it's probably closer to fair market value than even I thought when I was doing my analysis because I was not factoring in shipping into those prices. So that is something I would have to keep in mind next time if I'm going to participate. But I really like the fact that they're not running auctions weekly. That really helps my wallet. Uh, but it was a, a pretty good experience. But you have to be prepared. You have to have you know, your list of books that you're going to target and put your ranges like you would in any other sort of live auction experience, any claim sale-like experience. You have to prepare ahead of time. Put your caps where you're not going to go above. But all in all, I think I will be on the lookout for their next auction and definitely participate again. Thanks for watching, happy collecting, and see you next time.